so the question is, what is the legal situation with the whole male petting out in England? The situation is that it's very greatly reduced in the amount of prescribing on the National Health Service over the last five years, and also all five Bachelor of Science degrees which existed in 2007 in homeopathy have now closed down. Uh, that, that's a job with which I've been pleased to help the universities <laughs> by revealing the nonsense that was taught on the courses and this has embarrassed them into closing it down. So how close are you then uh, to, or NHS close, to not uh, the, the, you know, cover the subscription? subscription? Well, according to the Financial Times, the number of prescriptions has fallen by over 90% over the last five years. There has been a lot of work done, in, almost entirely by bloggers, actually. But as so often, the mainstream media have followed along behind <laughs> the investigative work of bloggers. And uh, now, newspapers like the Daily Mail, for example, which notoriously publicise bad medicine, are now starting to publish quite sensible papers. And indeed, that's probably part of the reason why the university courses have closed down, because the, um, it, it, the more bad publicity the subject gets, the fewer people will apply for these courses. Do you think that uh, the, the day when the homeopathy will, uh, will uh, be over is close? Oh, I don't think it'll ever vanish entirely, and I, I don't think it should be banned. All that should happen is that they should be prevented from making false health claims. In fact, the Advertising Standards Authority has placed very stringent uh, restrictions on what homeopaths can, can claim. They say they, they, they can't mention any named disease in their advertisements, which is a huge restriction, uh, and that's quite recent. So. If there are, there will no doubt continue to exist homeopaths on the high street, they won't be able to claim very much legally, uh, but no doubt people will continue to go to them, and that's fair enough. You, know, it's, uh, you, you can't ban beliefs, however stupid they may be, a bit like religion, really. <laughs> so um, I, I'm very happy to regard these people as being a voluntary tax on the gullible. You know, that's in the words of Ben Goldacre. Uh, I, I don't want to ban them, um, but I do want to prevent them from making false health claims. And I certainly want to prevent them from being paid for by me, via the National Health Service. And I certainly want to prevent subjects like this, which are the very opposite of science, being taught in universities. Well, the university bit has been al almost completely successful. Gone. The prescribing on the NHS has fallen very considerably, so that's good. Um, the no, it won't ban vanish entirely, of course. Uh, but we, at least we get back, I think, to the situation in the 1960s where it was a very fringe subject which very few people believed in or paid for. And I think we're well headed back to that stage. Uh, many people would say if it, you know, those fields do no harm, then uh, why you should uh, be against it? Ah, well, if they did no harm, that would be a reasonable argument. I mean, still, <laughs> to give a pill which doesn't work would be dubious, even if it did no harm, of course, because it's deceiving people. Uh, but the fact is that they do do harm. There was an investigation on the Newsnight television program quite recently where they investigated ten homeopaths, I think it was, nine of which recommended homeopathic pills for preventing malaria, for someone going to areas where malaria was endemic. Um, now these pills contain nothing whatsoever, they're just a bit of sugar. <laughs> this is the amazing thing about homeopathy. It is literally the medicine which contains no medicine. There are simply nothing in the pills. It's, uh, you can't believe that people believe it, but a lot, some people do nonetheless. Um, and to recommend that to prevent malaria I is criminally uh, harmful, potentially. People take these sugar pills, of course it won't pre uh, prevent malaria. It, the Queen's homeopath said that this recommendation 
made him very angry. There are one or two more sensible homeopaths. Spectrum, like anything else. Look, any of them are very sensible, but uh, Peter Fisher, who's the Queen's homeopath, uh, said that this made him very angry, this business about malaria. But most homeopaths don't think like that. They're quite happy to sell you uh, pills to prevent malaria. And this is just wicked. It's homicide. In Australia, two homeopaths were sent to jail, a man and wife, for six years and four years for manslaughter because they treated their own daughter only with homeopathy for a condition which was, was treatable. And this was, that, that, was, that was harm. It killed their daughter. <laughs> so it's not true just to say, not so simple as saying the pills don't do anything so they do no harm. The pills themselves don't do harm, but the faith in those pills and avoidance of proper treatment of things that are treatable uh, can kill you. What should be done more or it's done enough uh, in the campaign against homeopathy. Sorry. <laughs> That's right. So is it done enough, or what should be done more? It should be removed totally from universities, and the law about false advertising should be enforced properly. At the moment, the law about false advertising is, the law is in quite a satisfactory state, but its enforcement is a farce. The only people who have been really helpful in suppressing false claims have been the Advertising Standards Authority. And they have no teeth at all. They can't send anyone to jail or prosecute anyone. All they can say is that the advertisement should not be repeated in its present form. Uh, there are very good laws about false health claims as part of the Consumer Protection Regulations 2008. They're meant to be enforced by the Office of Fair Trading and by trading standards offices. And they simply don't do it. We have a study coming out in which we actually tested it by sending a lot of claims to uh, false claims to trading standards offices. About 15 different things were submitted. Trading standards did nothing. The enforcement of the law is in a complete mess, and that's one thing that needs to be sorted out now. When that's done, then the objections will go away. If they can't make false claims, that's fine. It means they won't be able to say very much, of course, uh, and that is going to reduce their number of customers, and that seems to me a good thing. <laughs> but it's a, g it's a big, big business, so it's hard to, to fight it. Yes, it's always hard to fight a big, big business. The Homeopaths and other for advocates of fringe medicine like to characterize the pharmaceutical industry as a big and corrupt business. And of course, they're quite right. It is both very big and very corrupt. What they neglect to say, that the alternative medicine industry is also a big, big business, like 60 billion pounds a year or something like that worldwide. And it is every bit as corrupt <laughs> as, as big pharma. They lie incessantly in order to promote their, their products. Most big businesses do, whether it's oil companies, pharmaceutical industries, or, 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 or the alternative medicine industry. The supplement industry is particularly bad because loopholes in the law allow some things, vitamin supplements and so on, to be treated not as drugs, but as food supplements. This means that they're restrict they, they don't have to satisfy any of the normal criteria that a drug would, that they've been tested for safety and efficacy. <coughs> and you can make claims, the most wild claims, without, uh, with impunity. Uh, of course, there are other laws that say you mustn't make false health claims, but they're not being enforced. So, so the situation is not at all satisfactory at the moment. All we need to do, in my view, having got it almost out of universities and almost out of the health service. The one remaining thing that is urgent is to have proper enforcement of laws which by and large already exist to stop people cheating on the public. All right. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. <laughs> yeah, I will send you... Uh, how do you prefer to, to have these uh, filed? I can send it by file or by DVD. Uh, a file would be best. File, yeah. okay, mm. sure. Yep.
you can use a drop box if it's too big for you know, yeah, attachment, I will. but, but yeah. um, UCL mail takes pretty big attachments. So. Mm -hmm. But uh, re uh, coming back to the homeopathy, uh, but so many people can tell you, you know, tons of stories about how it helped them. Yes. How could it help? What it, it's sort of that's a very interesting point because if you buy a transistor radio, it's very easy to tell whether it works or not. With a medicine, it is very difficult to tell whether it works or not. People ha do not begin to realize just how difficult it is to tell. Actually, when you think of it quite simple, it's because most of the time people don't die when they get ill, they get better. But most of the time they get better whether you take anything or not. So it is, it, if you have some condition, you take some treatment and two weeks later you're better, it is a very statistical phenomenon called regression to the mean, that's a technical term, but it's very simple, it's really just the get better anyway effect. A practitioner, medical or alternative, when you're at your worst, when you're at your worst, which conventional medicine can't cure, that accounts in part for the popularity of alternative medicines. The, the fact of the matter is, though, that if you look at low back pain treatment, when people have it and they go for treatment, that this happens regardless of which treatment you have. And it happens even if you have no treatment whatsoever. So it's purely this get better anyway effect. Uh, and the fact is that neither alternative nor Thank <laughs> you. 